What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of the Dolphins in Depth podcast. I'm Daniel Yafusi. Thanks so much for tuning in. And these are exciting times in Miami. It was a hectic week for the Dolphins franchise this past week with the lawsuit from former coach Brian Flores. But it kind of ended on a high note. The Dolphins late Sunday night announcing that San Francisco 49ers offensive coordinator Mike McDaniel is hired as their next head coach. Uh, He's set to be introduced sometime uh, this week. We should be getting details soon. Uh, But after a month's long search for Flores' successor, the Dolphins have their guy, 38 years old, run game, maestro, girl, whatever you want to call it. He will be leading the Dolphins for the foreseeable future. Uh, In this pod, we'll be tackling that hire and what it means for the Dolphins uh, from every single angle. Uh, I first want to introduce or bring in Andre Fernandez, uh, who will be talking Dolphins with me for the next uh, 40 minutes or so. Andre, how you doing? Well, I'm pretty good for a guy who's older than the Dolphins coach. Yeah. I'm, so, I'm still younger than Tom Brady, though, just, to, just by a little bit. Just gotcha. a so years. Right, right in the middle there. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. like I said, McDaniel, a, a very young guy, 38. I think I read that he's the fourth youngest coach um, in the NFL right now, but uh, he, he he's the Dolphins man right now. I, I don't know if you've seen the Dolphins social media account, but they posted a lot uh, kind of behind the scenes footage of him on the private mm-hmm. jet to Miami, him and his family and his wife, his young daughter. Um, yeah. there, was a, there was a cool moment FaceTime video with him and Tua even where he said, man, I'm going to, I'm going to bring everything out of you. Uh, I'm going to make you, I'm going to make this one of the best days yeah. of your career. Well, uh, so yeah, the Dolphins are giving us all the feels and they're, they're pulling in all the, all, all the strings right now yeah. as they bring well, in their new coach. I mean, it, it's who the fans wanted. I mean, remember, we, I think the last time I was here on, on, on the pod with you, you, we talked about that, that he was the fan favorite. People were very impressed with what he's accomplished with the 49ers. And they got their wish. So now, yeah, I mean, that's one of the biggest one of the biggest layers of all this is can he do that? Can he make Tua into the quarterback that every Dolphins fan hopes that he can be and and, and take those, you know, noticeable strides in, you know, in year three next year and, and bring that out of him and see if he is that indeed that quarterback of the future. So, yeah, we'll see. I mean, that's a good that's a good start. Good for them to start developing that rapport, you know, even more so now over the next few weeks and months uh, as, you know, as we get deeper into the off season. Yeah. Tua was definitely, you know, I, I don't want to say, well, I, I mean, I guess you could probably say this was a two a higher. I mean, it was clear from the beginning that they wanted to get an offensive minded guy to get the most out of not only Tua but to this, this entire offense, which struggled so much in 2021. And um, just from knowing some of the decision makers, thinking, you know, they really did like not only his his kind of um, ability or his plan for QB development specifically to him, mm-hmm. but just his overall reputation for developing players. I mean, you look back at San Francisco um, and what they did with, with Debo Samuel, con- turning yeah. him from a wide receiver to a running back. He says he calls the position wide back now, you know, wide receiver <laughs> running back. Um, the work that they did with Jimmy Garoppolo, who's, you know, not a top 10 quarterback, um, but kind of limiting and masking um, the limitations of him and getting him to play to his potential. Um, and it's just interesting to me how it kind of all developed in the last month. You know, this was a guy who I'm not sure if anybody else interviewed him for a head coaching um, gig. I, I didn't see any reports of that, um, but he became this kind of like court hero instantly with Dolphins Twitter, as we said before, just because of the 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 funny press conferences and some of the jokes and just his quirky personality. And, and I don't know, like. I'm not rooting for the Dolphins per se, you know, I'm not, not rooting for them. It's always, it's always great when they're doing well. Cause that, that means, you know, more eyes um, for the paper, but good for I, business. Yeah. Exactly. It's good for business, but I was excited. <laughs> like, I mean, I got to admit, I was excited. Like we all know that he's a much different personality than Flores. And I'm just excited of the, the prospects of, you know, talking to him in these press conferences and um, you know, he, he, he's such a smart guy. He explains the game. Well, I've spoken to a former player who says like, he's the brightest football mind in the, in the game right now um so i'm excited you know I, I don't know if this is you know the quote-unquote right hire i mean there's definitely mm-hmm. some candidates who you would say were probably more experienced more um i don't want to say deserving but um had more maybe more qualifications um but it's different it's it's a risk and it's, it's kind of like if it doesn't work at least it's going to be fun I, i'll put it that way <laughs> right I mean, the reviews seem to be good. I mean, not just internally from San Francisco, but it seems like there's a lot of voices around the league that have said he's one of the more innovative, like you said, one of the more innovative minds. We saw what he did with Debo. And then also with the 49ers offense, you, as you've seen, 
very similar in the sense, maybe not as prolific The Dolphins hope they get to be that prolific, but in the sense of in the running game, especially, I think can benefit from it. Uh, we've seen the Dolphins have been able to run the ball, but with several different options out of the backfield, sometimes out of necessity, the 49ers similar case, you know, in this last couple of years, the way that different guys are coming, even this year, everybody's expecting, I think we mentioned it before, we, nobody thought the sixth round pick Elijah Mitchell would be the one that would outplay Trey Sermon and get the, the starting role, but he turned out and now he could be, and not could be, he is one of the better running back, one of the best young running backs in the game today. And again, all of that, you look at that creativity that they have on offense. If he brings that to Miami to complement what was already a very good defense this past season, it's exciting potential. And you look at it, I mean, got to remember this team. I mean, I know it took a seven game winning streak to get to that point, but it's they're coming off a nine and eight season, which overall you look at this team, they're probably like that middle of the pack where they are. It's not like they're coming all the way from the bottom and need major retooling. So if he ends up, you know, being the right person that can kind of take this the next step forward, it would be an exciting time for them. Yeah, I know a lot of people were, were split on kind of where the franchise is. Um, obviously, you know, they had a seven-game winning streak, but that was preceded by a seven-game losing streak. They finished nine and eight, and the perception is, you know, they're still maybe a few steps away from contending. And I understand that thinking, but but I, I still do believe that, you know, finishing nine and eight, having a potential top 10 uh, defense in the league, I mean, if he can get the right pieces in there, I mean, the, I think that there's a there's a maybe not a a high ceiling because you still have questions about Tua, but there's definitely a high floor. There's definitely a high mm -hmm. floor. I think this is definitely a potential playoff team in in 2022, and you know it's it's going to be a stark difference, as you said. You know, this was one of the worst. The Dolphins, I'm saying, or were one of the worst running teams in the NFL. I mean, I believe they were like 30 and 31st in yards per attempt and uh, and total yards. But with Mike McDaniel, I mean, if you listen to his to his interviews, the way he speaks about the game, I mean, he he believes in running the football or at least providing or posing the threat of running the football. I mean, there's there's a, he seems like he's definitely because he's younger, he's definitely more analytically inclined um, and, and he knows that the way to best attack defense is to like manipulate their eyes. So there was a there's a great quote in The Athletic about saying, hey, the defenses might have two safeties deep and they might uh, they might force you uh, to, to run the ball. And he's like, we want to do that. You know, we want to pose that threat where they start to bring uh, a guy into the box. And now we can start to, excuse me, manipulate their eyes with play action, get them out of their 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 zone areas uh, and really put them in conflict. Um, so, again, I mean, he seems like a really, really smart guy. I mean, that's what everyone says. I mean, that's the first thing yeah. to say is intelligent, brilliant, smart. Uh, I thought it was funny that uh, Sean McVay, who he coached with back in, in Washington a couple of years back, he mm -hmm. said, selfishly, I'm not happy. I'm, I'm not sad to see him leave the division. And Robert Sala, who he coached with in San Francisco, said, selfishly, I don't want him to come to the division. Right. So it's definitely, yeah. definitely funny to see the, the reactions. Yeah, uh, but of course, and we, we say all that. And yes, he may be a great. X's and O's coach, great schemer, all of that. You also, I'm curious to see as this story develops, as we see him get more and more comfortable, what's he like? Because you, you, need, you can be a good X's and O's coach, but can he command the locker room? Yeah. Can, he, can he get the respect of those players? Can he motivate them? Can he get them up when they need to in big games, that sort of thing? Can he adjust well? Because obviously that's something that every coach has to do on the fly, that sort of thing. And then you need the talent because you were talking about that running game. Part of that is up front. And those are needs that, you know, you hope that McDaniel and Chris Greer and, and just the organization together can address these needs properly in the off season, both through the draft and free agency, because in order, I mean, you can be as innovative as you want, but you need to be good up front and they need those, you know, they need the talent up front to be able to enable that running game to be prolific the way it was for them in San Francisco. And, so that's those are all questions that obviously will be answered in the coming months. So we'll see if, if the Dolphins can translate that in, into wins. But, yeah, it's a good start and um, he comes highly recommended. So let's see what happens. Yeah, when you, when you talk about the leader of men thing, I think that that sticks out to a lot of people because he doesn't look like a football coach. I mean, he's he's a Yale graduate, Ivy League educated, um, former wide receiver there. Um, there's been a lot of jokes that he looks like, you know, he, he should work in Silicon Valley. I've seen <laughs> NFT nerd jokes and all that. And again, he just doesn't fit the profile of like the quote unquote stereotypical coach. 
Um, but e- even, you know, I spoke with Andrew Hawkins, who he coached um, in, in Cleveland, a former wide, NFL wide receiver. I mean, he said he doesn't he, he's quirky. He doesn't look like a coach, um, but he treats people with respect. He's honest with them. And he's like, that's what you want as a player. You want somebody that's going to be honest with you, treat you with respect and, and treat you in a way um, that's that's filled to, to get the most out of you. So I really feel like th- there won't be issues there. I mean, we've seen the the tough nose, hard nose coaches who are the quote unquote leaders of men. And sometimes it just doesn't really, it doesn't really connect. There's a disconnect with players because it's almost like you're not letting them be men and be grown men and be, be NFL players. So I think that's, that's not going to be an issue there. One thing, and this kind of leads me to the next part of our discussion. I guess one thing that sticks out to me is in I'm sure that we'll find this out at the news conferences. You know, there still are some questions. Like, um, I think the one thing that sticks out to a lot of fans is he wasn't the one that was necessarily calling the plays or he wasn't the primary play caller um, in San Francisco. Kyle Shanahan had that role. And while it was partly a collaborative effort, especially in the week to week game planning, um, I mean, how much of that is an issue for you? I mean, the Dolphins have had uh, offensive coaches in the past who necessarily didn't necessarily you know have a initial role in the play calling when they were assistants how much of that is an issue to you well I mean that's gonna that to me puts a lot of emphasis on who who does he have who does he bring in as an OC because if he's not gonna be that guy over here with the Dolphins then it's gonna rely a lot on that choice and not to get too ahead because I know we're gonna talk about potential staff in the next segment and everything but you see some of the people that have been talked about and you hope that it kind of jives with the style that he's hoping to bring to Miami to, to kind of bring that offense to the next level. I mean, that's going to be huge because yeah, you're, you're right. Because I was like, we were saying before about adjusting on the fly and in games and all that sort of thing and calling the right plays, his lack of experience. I mean, maybe from what he learned from Kyle Shanahan, we'll see how much it translates when he's the one, he's the one voice, or is it going to be more, like you said, more of a collaborative effort between him and the, the the person that he brings in as the OC, I mean, that's going to, again, I just think style-wise, it's going to have to be, that's going to have to be probably close to just as important of a hire for the Dolphins in the coming days and weeks as the one as, as the one to get McDaniel here in the first place, because that's going to dictate pretty much how this offense has run. And as we know, that's been the deficiency of this team for some time now. And it, to me, too, uh, again, we saw how wide the gap is between the Dolphins and the Chiefs and the Bengals and you, know, you name it, all the teams at the, at the at the top tier of the league right now. To narrow that gap, it's a lot of it is going to come down to quarterback because you know again, like like we talked about the last time, look at all it's a lot of a lot of the best teams. It's the elite quarterbacks or at least the ones that are prolific ones. You know that that can when it comes to shove when it's that when you need that difference maker, they can take that team to to over the top to that next level and. If he can't get to it to get to that point, then this franchise has a big decision to make beyond that. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and as I ask this, as I ask this next question, um, obviously we're recording this before uh, Mike McDaniel's introductory press conference, so we're still kind of waiting um, for, for all that to unfold. But is there anything that you would, in particular, like to to hear him say or do or just present? I mean, we we talk so much about head coaches in their initial press conference kind of winning the presser and kind of setting the tone. I remember last, last year. So Dan Campbell said, you know, talking about biting off kneecaps and whatnot. I mean, is there anything that you would, you would like to hear from? Cause this is, this is really his moment. This is his first moment to really like address Dolphins fans and to in some way kind of lay out his vision for the organization. What, what would you like to hear from him? Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's, I think I, I, I'm one that I, I like study demeanor too. Like when, how somebody reacts, how somebody, how somebody not only handles, only answers the question, but just the, the kind of like the, the presence that they give off, because that's the, that's the one I, I go back to again, like you were talking about, you don't have to flip a table and, and, and choose someone out necessarily, but there's a way that you're going to command the respect of those players, especially in tough situations. You're going to face adversity a lot in the NFL from time to time. What's he going to come off as, and is that going to be the, the 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 guy that generates that respect from his players? You know, and does he have a level of intensity that he ha- that he can get to? Because every coach has to have it, like you said, whether they're loud, you yeah. know, crazy saying stuff, you know, whatever. Even if not, even if they're more reserved, we've seen more reserved coaches win as well. It doesn't. You don't have to be the guy that that goes insane in the locker room either. But 
that can he reach that level of intensity and, and handle that? I guess I kind of want to see it's the first time you kind of really hear in this setting, see how he handles it. You know what I mean? And I think yeah. that's more than anything, what I'm kind of looking forward to, to see, to, to see that part of, of Mike McDaniel. Yeah. There's definitely, you know, a difference from being a coordinator where you're speaking to the media once a week. And right. then when you got to address the media three, mm-hmm. four times a week and you're getting the tougher questions, you know, it's different. Every, yep. Everyone everyone loves the coordinators because the coordinators are the guys who don't speak as much. So they can kind of be right. more free, more loose. <laughs> and in all the videos you see of him, he's more happy-go-lucky. He's making yep. jokes. So I do wonder when he, because I mean, I think there, there are going to be some tough questions. You know, this is the first time yep. that we're going to be speaking to uh, Mike McDaniel, obviously, but I'm assuming that Chris Greer and or Steve, owner Stephen Ross would make themselves available as well. So it's the first time yeah. um, that they're really going to address the floor's allegations, his firing um, in, in depth, really, since the lawsuit came out. I do wonder how he maneuvers and goes through that because it's it's a great time for him. I mean, you, I mean, he, I'm sure he's happy. His family's happy. They're all proud of him. But again, these are kind of tumultuous times with the Dolphins yeah. um, and, and the Dolphins, as I've written, as we all know, you know, they haven't had this level of postseason success in over two decades. So while everyone's happy and everyone's excited about kind of a new era, um, there's still going to be expectations to produce, you know, after kind of the honeymoon phase settles, so to speak. Yeah. I, I guess another question if somebody asks it in some way, shape or form would be, I guess, like you just said about the turnover with this team, especially on the coaching side, if someone would say, why should we believe that it's going to work with him? I was, I that, that, that's, have... that's really the number one question that if I right. got the opportunity, like why, right. why, and I don't mean it in a cynical way. I mean, I mean, no, it, exactly. Honestly, right. like, it's just, I want to hear what yeah. he would say. Right. Yeah. No, that, yeah. So we're, we're on the same page right there. Yeah. No. Yeah. And you're right about the, you know, you, 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 now he's going to have to talk on those long August days after camp for 10, 20 minutes when you're tired after two, three hours, he's going to have to talk after a bad loss, after maybe a boneheaded play costs a game, as well as when, you have a, a big win. So all the, all that, it's going to be very interesting to see. I mean, in, in any coach, in any situation where you're coming in as a first time head coach, there's, there's obviously an adjustment period. So I'm curious to see how he handles it. Now, most definitely it's going to be fascinating when they officially introduce Mike McDaniel. Uh, we're going to take a short break, but when we come back on the other side of things, we're going to talk more about what this hire means for the Dolphins, uh, potential coaching staff as he kind of hits the ground running, um, what it means big picture for the roster, as well as talk Super Bowl. You know, there, there is a, a game this weekend, the final <laughs> game of the 2021 season. We're going to discuss that as well. So stay with us. What's going on, everybody? I'm still here with Andre Fernandez talking all things Dolphins and the hire of Mike McDaniel, former, now we can say former San Francisco 49ers offensive coordinator, uh, newly minted Dolphins head coach. Uh, the Dolphins haven't officially inter- uh, excuse me, introduced Mike McDaniel, as we said, but um, he arrived in South Florida last night. You can go on the Dolphins Twitter page, see all the great videos and photos uh, that their people have been uh, putting together. They, they gave us plenty of evidence that he's in town and they he's did. Not, it's he, real. He signed, sealed, <laughs> delivered. Yep. Yeah, I was, was going to say, we, we, we didn't want a Josh McDaniel situation <laughs> where, you know, you think you got him and, you know, uh, slips sorry. Out the right? Yep. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. But, um, you know, as, uh, as we kind of alluded to before, I mean, he's going to hit the ground running as all new coaches do in the first order of business, as, as I wrote um, yesterday uh, on the Miami Herald's website is assembling a staff. Um, I said it was the fatal flaw, really, of Brian Flores' tenure as, uh, you know, head coach of the Dolphins going through, I believe it was four offensive coordinators or um, four offensive line coaches, several pitches and coaches on the offensive side of the ball. Um, so, so certainly Mike McDaniel is going to have to find that continuity with this coaching staff. And again, it's going to be a fluid process. You know, I think that um, whoever he brings in on this initial staff, not everyone is going to be back for year two. Some guys you're going to figure out um, aren't fits. Some guys are going to go on to better opportunities. But this first staff is really important to kind of lay the foundation and the groundwork for the team that he wants, uh, that he wants, you know, in, in Miami. And it's, it's interesting, the decisions he has to make really starting on the defense side of the ball, because all the reports and, uh, you know, kind of assumptions were that Dolphins management kind of wanted most of the defensive staff 
uh, to stay in place, which makes sense. You know, that was a top 12, top 10 defense by the end of the year. There's some really, really good positional coaches that uh, have played an instrumental role in the development of the young core on the defense side of the ball. And you have Josh Boyer, who, you know, seems like a more than capable defensive coordinator. Obviously, Flores has his input and kind of really steered the shit with that defense. But but I think that Boyer is, is more than capable. Um, you know, have reports of potential interest in Vic Vangio, the former Denver Broncos defensive coordinator. Um, I mean, what do you think about that? I mean, I personally think that the continuity is definitely well served for this team. Because again, I do think that this team is definitely capable of reaching the playoffs um, in 2022. And it's almost like, you don't really need a full scale rebuild on that side of the ball. You need more of a tune up. Um, if if he kind of opts to get Vic Vangio in there just because he's a more experienced defensive uh, coordinator, um, keeps guys like defensive backs coach Gerald Alexander, uh, cornerbacks coach Charles Burks. I really do think that that would be a really good way to kind of just get on the right footing because I mean that's an experienced staff over there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I it's it's rare, right? Because usually a new coach comes in, cleans house. It's pretty much brings in his own people for the most part, but you're seeing, you know, and in this case where he's considering at least not to, I mean, I, I think it comes down to philosophy. I think if they, I like the fact that they were a blitz heavy team last year. I think they need it. I think it's something I hadn't seen from the dolphins in a while, just that aggressiveness. And I think it made such a difference when they were able to pressure quarterbacks in this league, you have to do that. You ha- there's no way you survive. If a quarterback sits back there and pick, it can sit back there and pick you apart. And the Dolphins, for the most part, were able to do that in a lot of games this year. So, like you said, if they can add a few more a few more pieces back there to enhance that, I th- if philosophically Vic Fangio comes in and it's something that can keep that defense in that style or in that in in that sort of shape where it can be as productive as it was, then fine. You bring in you 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 count on his experience. But if not, I don't have a problem at all with them. You know, keeping the main the main people in place, especially Josh Boyer, if he's familiar. And I would assume he has the, again, we were talking about the respect of the players and, and the way they play for him. I would, from the way it looked last year, they, it, he's a guy that they would. So if that, that can continue, that's some continuity that is very valuable. I think on that side of the ball, it's rare when you can do that. And I, I, I think they should, I think, unless it's something, but ma- mainly I think it comes down to scheme and, and if they can keep consistent to what they believe in and what, what worked last year the most. Yeah, Andre, you made a great point about philosophically what is McDaniel want to do on defense, because um, for all we know about his offensive mindset, you know, running the ball, um, ball control, um, controlling the line of scrimmage. We don't really I mean, I haven't really seen much about just his overall defensive philosophy. I mean, he knows the defense side of the ball, but we don't There's another know. another question for, for, yeah, for Thursday. Yeah, we don't know if his mindset is, oh, I want to, you know, whether he wants to prioritize, you know, coverage or, or the front. Um, Pro Football Focus had a, um, I think it was Ryan Smith from Pro Football Focus had a really good thread of kind of detailing some of the similarities and the differences of really mainly the, the offenses, you know, the Dolphins offense compared to the 49ers offense this season. Um, but he made a good point. I think that the 49ers ranked like 23rd in man defense. Um, the cornerback was not the strong suit the defensive line with, you know, I think believe it was, uh, Nick Bosa and some of those guys mm-hmm. was really the strength of that defense. So they really leaned on that and tried to get more guys in coverage, play more zone um, because they didn't have guys like Xavier and Howard or Byron Jones. So, I mean, right. obviously, again, the personnel was a little different there. Um, I, I do think that the Dolphins defense is right on par with the 49ers defense. And really, if you look at the secondary, they're more talented. So I do wonder if, Um, You know, another thing that he's known for is McDaniel, that is, is fitting the scheme to the players that he has. You know, he has a system in place that Shanahan offense in place, but they he hasn't shown or he has shown um, an ability to kind of be fluid in in morphing the scheme to best fit the skills of his players. So I do wonder if he comes and he says, oh, I mean, this scheme fits the players perfectly. Let's go with that. Maybe tweak it a bit. Um, that, That really will be interesting. And you know, when you go to the offense side of the ball, I mean, that's what everyone is really, really focused on. It seems like he is going to keep some of the defensive assistance, but the offensive side is where, you know, everyone is is, is kind of, you know, waiting with, with big eyes. Um, I know it, there was a report today from The Athletic that uh, the team is going to interview Atlanta Falcons quarterbacks coach mm-hmm. Charles London. 
um, which was, I guess, an interesting name. He just finished his first season as QB coach there. Um, he previously coached running backs with the Chicago Bears for the past three seasons. So, I mean, he has a he has a running running back background there. And obviously with uh, Mike McDaniel seeming to want to really establish the run, do you think that might be a good fit? Um, I mean, how important is is that offensive coordinator hire? Because we still don't know if he's going to call the plays. Um, but obviously he previously as an OC had a really big role in terms of the game planning, the play design. Um, I mean, how big is that hire in itself? And I mean, who is somebody that you might be uh, keeping your eyes on? Well, that, that would, I think Charles London right there was one that caught me uh, that struck me because of the fact, like you said before, you know, we were talking about if the scheme fits and, and all of that. I mean, he comes in, And, you know, he's worked with Matt Ryan, one of the better quarterbacks in the league. And like you said, he has the running background, too. It's kind of interesting to me because you look at Atlanta's offense. They got a lot out of Cordero Patterson this year. I mean, it was a breakout season for him and very similar in a way to the innovative way they that San Francisco implemented uh, Debo Samuel on offense. I mean, Cordero Patterson was kind of just like, you know, utility guy in new england special really teams return special teams yeah. exactly now they turn him into you know kind of like that you know christian mccaffrey debo samuel type where he can do a little bit of everything can catch run special packages all sort of things and, and becomes really a lead back and i mean that to me was like all right now you're gonna pair if they hire if they were to hire him you pair those two together with him and mcdaniel i mean that's an exciting prospect if they, if, if, if it, again, if it gels and they're both the same similar way of thinking and you can create a, a, a dynamic offense that's creative like that. And, and, you know, obviously you need the personnel, but if you get the right people in place where they can be this creative on offense, that that's definitely, you know, something that I think would, would peak a lot of a uh, Dolphins fan interest for sure. So, I mean, I, I'm curious to see. I mean, I haven't seen a lot of names that really stick out unless maybe it's someone that he brings over from San Francisco. You mentioned, earlier this week that that was a possibility so i mean if it's not him i don't i mean right now a lot of ocs are flying around you know moving now that all the head coaches are in place yeah there's still some jobs that are being you know guys that are still being hired around the league so it'll be interesting to see what what how it works out yeah two other names for the offensive coordinator spot that have just been kind of floated out there and rumored just because of the connections to him uh one is Wes Welker who is the 49ers <laughs> wide receivers coach obviously he spent his Next first, Dolphin. Yep. yeah he, yeah he spent, spent his first three seasons in Miami um yep. I'm not sure I mean again I, I don't know much about just the work he's done in San Francisco and Welker in that regard but that would be a, an interesting hire I mean just he's a young guy as well um, but one that I think would, would make sense is uh, Rich Scar- Scangarell. Let me get his name right. Yeah. He's currently the, the quarterback's coach um, with San Francisco. He's been with San Francisco with uh, for three seasons over two stints. Um, but there's actually a, there's like a Twitter page. I think it's like the QB Collective. And um, mm-hmm. they do a lot of deep dives on coaches. And, you know, they've Scangarello and McDaniel have done a lot of kind of these workshops with QBs and working with them. So it would be an interesting hire. He, he has coordinator experience um he was a coordinator with the Denver Broncos for one season under Vic Fangio um so I mean that would be a kind of a natural kind of promotion elevation for for a guy who was formerly a quarterback's coach um you know just because and, and again I don't know as much but it seems that McDaniel doesn't have the I guess the reputation as much for being like a QB girl girl excuse me guru, guru. Yeah. <laughs> there we go you got it guru long, as much long as, week You're, it's okay <laughs> uh, tell me about it yeah he doesn't have that that reputation for developing quarterbacks necessarily as much as it is for you know developing the run game so i think it would be really nice obviously they're going to hire a quarterbacks coach too but it would be nice to get like an offensive coordinator who like really really has worked with the with quarterbacks um yeah. to, to have him into his ear on that week-to-week game planning um and that seems like a, a natural fit right there that's what that's, I, was, I was thinking about that while you were saying that, too, is, you know, the quarterback coach, get, hiring a quarterback coach, how, I don't know if we're putting too much on that, but at least uh, it sounds like it's a good idea, especially considering how important the whole Tua situation is going to be. So to have someone with even added perspective, I mean, I remember when the Dolphins, when, when Brian Dable was a target, people were talking about, does then he bring Ken Dorsey over? Exactly. You know, there was, that was the rumor of that too. And then we saw, you know, what happened then, but yeah, just whether it, whether it's London or anybody else, 
just to have someone that not only running the offense, but working directly with Tua, I think would be very important. Yeah. The the last thing I'll say on the search for a coaching staff is, and I bring this up because we know how bad the Dolphins offensive line was in, in 2021. Um, Mike Munchak's name has been floated a lot. I mean, there's no, there's been no concrete reporting to it. I think it's more um, optimistic Dolphins fans just kind of floating this around. Um, but man, that'd be, that'd be a slam dunk hire. I mean, this offensive line was egregiously bad in 2021. Um, we've been beating it on, beating the point on the table for months that they could severely and seriously use a veteran proven uh, offensive line coach who has like a, a, a concrete track record of developing guys. Um, there's been, there's been, you know, people questioning the fit there, like the, with the zone running scheme. And I mean, he, he's done this for like two decades or even probably even more. I mean, I, I think he can teach whatever scheme um, McDaniel ha- has there. And um, again, if they can get him, if they can get a, a, a solid offensive coordinator, I mean, I think this offense has a really, really strong base. I mean, we know that they're going to, they're definitely going to be, um, you know, they're going to be very, very aggressive and free agency to get, you know, McDaniels guys, quote unquote, but, you know, I even look at toward the, the end, uh, the second half of the season, when the offense starts to like, kind of come together a little bit, um, and they were really relying heavily on Duke Johnson and, and um, Philip Lindsay. I mean, they were able to incorporate some of those zone outside run elements. I mean, the first time I saw them run a toss, to be honest, was when they had Philip Lindsay back in the, in the backfield. Um, so, again, we don't know. Those guys are unrestricted free agents. We don't know what their future holds in Miami. But I do think that if they do want to bring them back on a, on a short term, um, inexpensive uh, deal, I mean, I think there's there's a room for them to really flourish in that that zone running scheme. Yeah, it, it, they're going to have to bring back to just for depth purposes, because, you know, you hope they, they address maybe through the draft, uh, the running back position as far as who may be the lead. Uh, guy but then you're not going to throw it all on the rookie so you're yeah. going to have to and that's a discussion for another time who that could be but um yeah uh, I mean going back to the Munchak thing I mean people who listen to the Marlins pod know that Jordan and I I, I tend to joke about how old I am and I did earlier uh, I remember when Mike Munchak was blocking you know oh, yeah. was a lineman <laughs> himself and and he was a very good one I mean we're talking one of the best in the game so I mean the knowledge he's uh, that he would bring to that old line up front would be would be tremendous but again i think you know it, it comes down to how much they can develop the guys there's st- it's still a young old line for the most part development and then adding even more reinforcements there through the draft and, and through free agency this offseason and some if, if one of those uh, players out there somebody that's maybe at an all pro caliber you know that could come in and really help out up front that'd be that'd be great we know that they're going to have some money to play with so yeah yeah, I guess the last thing uh, I'll ask before we get into some Super Bowl stuff is, I mean, is there a particular player you're most excited to, to see in this potential uh, Mike McDaniel offense? I mean, we've spoken so much about what he's going to bring. Um, you know, there's been people talking about Jalen Waddle becoming the next Debo Samuel, which I don't I don't see. Waddle is a little smaller than Debo. Um, but is there anybody in particular you're you're excited to see? I mean, Tua is obviously going to be the focal point of that. Um you could potentially see a resurgence of Miles Gaskin. Lynn Bowden is a guy who people have mentioned as potentially being a Debo Samuel type. Anybody in particular? I'm, I'm here doing the thinking pose for people that are projecting <laughs> what we look like, what we're doing right now. Um, because that that Jalen Waddle's definitely a good one. I mean, Mike Isicki made some strides this year, I think, at tight end. But I'd be curious to see how much he thrives even more. I mean, George uh, Kittle, one of the best in the league, it was there with, with McDaniel. I mean, he was already George Kittle, but I mean, we'll see. I mean, maybe maybe he can make another leap. But uh, you know, someone else too, which has had his ups and downs, and I know it comes down to health and if he can stay on the field. But Devontae Parker has had an up and down career. Maybe this helps being in this offense a little more. I mean, I don't know contractually. I don't know how many more years. What what's what, what what what's his status at this point? I mean, he's he's coming back, but. Well, I'd I love mean, to see, right? They, or, they, I believe he has two or so years left on that extension he signed in 2019, yeah. and they they can release him, and you know the dead cap money wouldn't be as severe. But again, they're going to have 70 million dollars in, in cap room if they decide to part ways with him. It's going to be because of the injuries, not really because you know they need the money, so to speak. You know? Yeah, I so. mean, if he stays, I, I mean, he's another one. Like I said, I mean, it's been it's been a roller coaster for him, and I know he's dealt with a lot of injuries, but I mean. 
if he could thrive in that offense because of the fact that you know Jalen Waddle is going to be, you know, highly explosive. He's going to get a lot of targets. If the offense improves, obviously that spreads the ball around even more, and it could allow for Devontae to really take a leap himself. So, I mean, they, they need to add, I think, in, in addition to the guys we just mentioned, you add at least one, as, as many explosive weapons as you can. So yeah. maybe maybe it's someone that's not even here on this roster yet that we'll see either drafted or signed through free agency. It will be interesting to see how much can be added and how much it'll work in, in, in McDaniel's scheme. Yeah, you make an interesting point about uh, Devontae Parker, because I think that in all the, the run game specialists, run game coordinator talk about McDaniel, you forget that, you know, he was a former wide receiver at Yale. Um, he was a mm-hmm. wide receiver coach. Again, I spoke to Andrew Hawkins, who he coached in, in Cleveland, and he said that, you know, he had the best years under McDaniel because of the way that he taught the position and the way he helped him in his releases and just kind of putting him in the best position to succeed as a wide receiver. So that that is interesting to see, again, um, another big part of this kind of honeymoon period and, and, you know, initial process is just going to be like uh, analyzing the entire roster and saying, this guy fits what, you know, what, what we want to do. I can get the most out of this. This guy doesn't fit me to bring in somebody else. So that's going to be a really interesting process. And it's going to be interesting to see how we kind of assesses this roster, you know? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, one last thing before we get out of here, we got to talk Super Bowl. Um, I actually will be that in excuse Los you Angeles. have to go to LA this weekend. Yep, I got an excuse <laughs> to go to. I mean, hey, Miami, LA. I'm just, I'm just living the life with, with great mm-hmm. cities. Uh, so thank you to the Miami. Yes, you are. There. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll be in LA for the Super Bowl to provide coverage uh, this week. Later this week, um, we have the Bengals and the Rams playing in their their own stadium. Uh, it's the second. Sh- straight season that we have, um, you know, a team playing in the Super Bowl in their, you know, their home stadium. Um, it's an interesting matchup. You know, we kind of have two, I don't want to say new teams because the Rams were were in this game a couple of years back, but obviously there's some some new faces on the Rams side with uh, Matt Stafford leading that team. We have Von Miller making his return to the Super Bowl, Odell Beckham Jr. Um, making his debut as well as Cooper Cup. And then on the other side, you kind of have kind of have the upstarts in a sense, you know, Joe Burrow and his uh, sophomore season uh, leading the Cincinnati Bengals, who, you know, are really the darlings of the NFL right now. You know, everyone's mm-hmm. in love with Joe Burrow and all the talk about what he can be. Uh, what do you think about this matchup and, and who comes out on top in the end? I mean, I like the matchup um, as far as the Rams, I think, because. I think they're I think they're a complete team. And I've said that even from the beginning from the middle of the season when you saw all the pieces in place and you saw everything clicking. It, it's almost there were weeks where it didn't. And I kept thinking to myself, I'm like, if this ever comes together where all every component of this team is playing at a high level, they have all the pieces they need. And it finally happened in the postseason. They had a close call with Tampa, which was probably the to me the one team that really had a shot at knocking them off. And it was impressive to see until that near comeback at the end they pretty much dominated that game but I think it starts up front I mean the addition of Von Miller to an already amazing amazingly aggressive defense with Aaron Donald there up front and their secondary with Jalen Ramsey you know and Taylor Rapp and everybody else I mean that that's a good secondary as well that's complimented them too you know and they have the weapons on offense they have the running game that didn't skip a beat after they lost Daryl Henderson you know they kept going getting Cam Akers back was huge I feel like Cincy, I like the Bengals as a team, but I feel like they're ahead of schedule. Yeah. You know, I, you know, they're, this is a team that I could see getting back there more than once in the next few years. I mean, it's going to be tough because it's going to be the battles between them. Kansas city is going to be Buffalo, there. Buffalo's yeah. on the way up. Right. Exactly. Um, but I think right now the Rams have everything. And I think the, as far as the defense, they kind of remind me of, where they just put so much on that defensive side, they overloaded it where they almost can't screw it up almost. And that reminds me of Tampa last year, which yeah. the, the way that they, you just look all across those 11, those 11 guys on the field. And you're like, this guy, this guy, everybody, everybody's solid. Everybody has a high floor. Everybody can make plays. And if, if, if they show up, I mean, I already saw the Tecmo Super Bowl simulation had them winning by 20. I don't know if they'll win by 20, <laughs> but I think they're going to, I think they will dictate the outcome of this game, I think, on the defensive side of the ball. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm rolling with the Rams as well. And it, I got to agree with you with the this game being decided in the trenches. You know, I mean, it's, it's a cliche, but it's true. Um, I think the most probably amazing thing about this Cincinnati Bengals run has been that Joe Burrow has been able to do what he's done with the bottom five offensive line. 
Mm. I mean, we saw him take nine sacks against the Titans and they somehow win that game. Um, But I mean, really it's like on paper, the Rams have more talent. Um, In terms of the quarterback play, they're probably neck and neck. I think Matthew Stafford has been pretty good uh, to honestly really good in, in the playoffs. He hasn't really made like the fatal mistake outside of, almost throwing it in. I mean, he almost made it in the championship game when he threw that punt up to the uh, the San Francisco defense and they just couldn't come down with it. But outside of that, he's avoided the major um, major mistakes. And again, I mean, it's just, just more, the more veteran team. It's, there is something about since he just had that underdog kind of element where it's like you just can't count them out. Um, and I don't want to call it luck, but I almost feel like the luck kind of runs out. You know, there was this, um, this, uh, this chart posted to Twitter by a pro football focus analyst and it ranked, there was a chart and it kind of posted all of the Super Bowl teams from like the past 10 years or so from 2011 up until now. And it ranked them by their regular season, uh, regular season offensive efficiency and defense efficiency. Um, Mm -hmm. So if you looked at it, it's like the closer you are to the bottom left, that's like pretty much you had a, a worse defense and a worse offense. And, you know, if you look at the chart on Twitter, um, most of the teams that have reached the Super Bowl in the past 10 years, they had like prolific, prolific offenses in terms of efficiency. Um, and surprisingly, despite, you know, having all these weapons, Jamar Chase, T. Higgins, Tyler Boyd, uh, Joe Mixon, surprisingly, the the Bengals were actually kind of ranked low. I mean, they were like, like 12th, which is like, you don't think that that's, you know, mad low but compared to some of the other Super Bowl Mm -hmm. teams they were they were more resembling of if you remember like the Joe Flacco Ravens of 2011 Mm -hmm. 2012 um and again that was yeah you know I'm from Baltimore I remember that was that was that was not a yeah yeah, that wasn't a great offense until Joe Flacco went crazy in the the postseason um so I, I do think that really over the past month or so I mean I know the the Bengals have been on a hot run I do think that even in the playoffs like if not for just the unfathomable kind of couple sequences by Patrick Mahomes in the AFC Championship game, I mean, we're probably looking at the Chiefs winning that game. I mean, I don't know. I do know what happened in the second half of that game. Um, the Chiefs just couldn't move the ball like short down the field. They're so used to throwing it deep. And the Bengals put eight guys in coverage and they just couldn't adjust. Um, but again, if Patrick Mahomes doesn't just kind of like lose his brain for a couple plays, I really do think that the Chiefs are playing in the Super Bowl now. Um, and again, you know, the Bengals are a talented young team. They're going to be in the running. You know, it's going to be hot potato with the AFC teams for the next 10 to 12 years. But I really do think that this time it's like the story, too, just kind of lines up better for the Rams. I mean, you have Sean McVay kind of getting redemption from his first Super Bowl, Matt Stafford getting over the hump. Um, Von Miller's second run, Odell kind of getting vindication for leaving Cleveland. Mm. He just and and obviously it's in Cincinnati. I mean, excuse me, it's it's in Los Angeles. It's in LA. Yeah, 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 it's it's going to be at SoFi Stadium. The, the stars just seem like they're kind of aligned for the Rams to, to win this game right here. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's not impossible because and I, it has been done before where you see a young quarterback lead a young team to a championship in their first shot at it. I mean, look at Patrick Mahomes did it a couple of years ago with with KC, but it just feels like more often than not, it's almost like they have to have that one trip, learn from it, and then come back, and then they win it, whether it's the following season or soon after. And it just feels like that's where Cincy is at right now. And, and you hope so because, let's say, if they do lose this game, you'd hate to see this be a fluke one and done and then you know, Joe, not see Joe Burrow ever make it back and not see that team really with Jamar Chase and all and all those exciting players ever get a shot at it again, because that also can happen, especially with the log jam that there is in the AFC right now and bringing it back to the home team. I mean, that just shows you right there. I mean, how does Miami break through that layer of ice that's like stuck, like, like stuck right there? Of, you, you name it, Cincy, Buffalo, KC. I mean, there's so many good teams at the top. You know, that, that's why this is a very crucial offseason uh, on so many levels for them. 
Yeah, it's definitely going to be a crucial offseason for the Dolphins to kind of bridge that gap between them and the upper echelon. But I'm excited for this game. You know, again, my first uh, Super Bowl in person that I'll be covering. I'm excited for it all. I mean, what are your favorite aspects of Super Bowl? I mean, you excited for the pregame stuff, the halftime show. I mean, I'm excited for the halftime show. I'm a big Kendrick Lamar fan. Uh, we're going to have, I'm trying, who, who else is in it? Eminem. I mean, yeah, Dr. Dre. Dr. They're going, Dre. They're going old school. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's, again, I, I, I'm really excited for that part of it for sure. And um, yeah, I mean, the halftime shows are you usually they they have their years where they're a little hit or miss. But I think this one's going to be cool, especially there in L.A. You know what I mean? That's like right in their backyard, right in their hometown. Yeah. And um, I always one one thing that I don't know, I'm, I'm those first 20 or so minutes, the introductions, the the little montage that they'll come up with that makes everything so epic. Like I'm a big epic movie guy. So. Okay. That gets me like more than every more than anything, you know, into the, the the excitement level for the Super Bowl. Like not so much the six hours where you're thinking to yourself, like, how many more stories can they come up with? Yeah. But that when it hits six o'clock and 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 those, that little bit to it, you almost get as hyped you know, that you, like, you <laughs> wanted to be there in person yeah. to see it. And and to me, that's one of my favorite parts is that those first 20 minutes, and then like you you really it really hits you like the magnitude of the game. And then they kick off, and after maybe a few minutes, then you're like, okay, I'm just watching a football yeah, game. Exactly. So, yeah, the league makes the whole – they make this whole week a spectacle. There's a lot of events yeah. and stuff going on in L.A., and it obviously culminates in, in this final game of the season. So I'm definitely excited for that and, and everything that comes with that. Uh, this brings us to the end of another edition of the Dolphins in Depth podcast. I wanted to thank Andre Fernandez so much for joining me to talk Dolphins, talk Mike McDaniel, talk Super Bowl. Um, again, exciting times in Miami – um, you know, followed by an exciting game this weekend. And we'll be back next week to recap everything from the Super Bowl to Mike McDaniel's introductory press conference uh, to the next step for the organization, as well as uh, him assembling his coaching staff. But until then, you guys take care. See you.